saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the owners of the Lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. I looked, therefore, and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things that is in them. I heard them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb the blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders then fell down and worshipped. There's a scene from Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 14, that depicts almost all of creation looking at Jesus, looking at the Lamb, and worshiping Him. You have this three-part section where over and over and over again, they worship Him, they praise Him, they glorify Him, but not just because He's Jesus, although that would be enough, the fact that He's God Himself. But what they praise Him for in Revelation, the fifth chapter, is the fact that He is a Lamb that was slain to bring salvation to all of the earth, everybody who would be obedient to Him. And when you look at these verses, especially right here, right at the beginning of what would eventually be a huge, gigantic book that spells the victory of God over Satan, you can't help but be overwhelmed about the sheer amount of joy that comes from witnessing salvation and seeing salvation and glorifying God for the salvation that He brings towards us. A few months ago, we sat here and watched as Connor was baptized. A year or so ago, we sat here and watched as Jayla was baptized. Right before that, we sat here and watched how Courtney was baptized. And every single one of those baptisms, and all the other ones that have been here, those are just ones off the top of my head, but all the baptisms that we've seen in our time here, every single one of them has been accompanied by a huge amount of joy. There's always the person that comes out of that little room, and then everybody in the entire congregation lines up and hugs them and praises them and says what a great decision that was made. And it is a time of great joy. I remember my own baptism. It happened... Ironically, on September 11th, several many years ago, before September 11th became known as something else, and I remember my own baptism. It happened at the end of a gospel meeting. My dad was actually the one that baptized me. And I remember going through that line where everybody's telling you what a great choice it was. Everybody's telling you that your life will be never the same from this point forward. It's the mark of the beginning of something so great. I remember one woman specifically, though, and I, I don't remember her name, and I don't mean to embarrass her by any stretch of imagination, but here I am, 11, 12, 13 years old, and she takes me by the shoulders, and when you're 11, everybody's bigger than you, and she takes me by the shoulders and kicks her head back and says, loud enough for everybody in world to hear, that there are angels rejoicing in heaven, and then as if to punctuate it, she says, right now, screams to the top of her lungs. And at 11 years old, I'm staring at her in her face, looking at her. I don't really know how to respond to that. But he's kind of quoted, she kind of brings to mind what Jesus said. Luke, the 15th chapter, verse 10, where Jesus points out about the idea of repentance and the idea of salvation. He says, in the same way I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I understand the context of Luke chapter 15 is talking about somebody who's apart from God, who ends up returning back to God. That's the context. But the same idea prevails in our discussion this morning. That when somebody comes to God, whether it's through repentance and they're asking for prayers and they're asking help with obedience, or somebody puts Christ on through the waters of baptism, the exclamation, the joy in heaven is the same. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than a thousand people who don't need, to re or don't, who don't need any repentance. That's where the glory, that's where the praise comes from. And it's verses like this, it's verses like what we read in Revelation, the fifth chapter, that reveal to me, that tell me that what's happening, maybe not in that moment, I don't mean to just kind of highlight that one as the be all end all, but there's more things happening during the process of conversion than just what we see. Because while we're down here giving the person a hug and telling them how great a decision it was and how it's the beginning of a new life, while we're busy here, angels in heaven, ladies and gentlemen, are rejoicing. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. We need to start looking at it through those spiritual eyes. 
When we talk about baptism in the world, a lot of people will try to relegate it, whether you're talking to people of the denominational world, whether you're talking to people who are atheists, they'll try to re relegate baptism as nothing more than kind of a token. Or some people will use a highly religious word, and they'll call it a sacrament. They'll say it's something you do, it's something you go through, but it doesn't really evoke any kind of salvation. Which is ironic considering 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21 says specifically, baptism, and I always have to use the King James Version, baptism, God, now save us. I don't know how you can get away from that. But a lot of people try to relegate it, try to minimize it, where it really doesn't have as much as an impact as it should. You know, a lot of people think that this kind of started with a guy named John Calvin. And John Calvin had a lot of really great things to say, had a, really, a lot of really horrible things to say. But there was a contemporary, more or less, was kind of a mentor to John Calvin. It was Holdrick Zwingli, if I'm pronouncing that right, who existed in the 1500s. And he was kind of known for spearheading this movement, not nearly the amount of fame that Calvin would have, but he was much more bold in what he said. For instance, he says, in this matter of baptism, if I may be pardoned for saying it, and you'll realize pretty soon that he's not to be pardoned for saying it, but he says, in this matter of baptism, I may be pardoned for saying it, I can only conclude that all the doctors, and that's just talking about teachers, all the doctors have been in error from the time of the apostles, 1,500 years before Zingley. All the doctors have been in error from the time of the apostles, and they have ascribed to the water a power which it does not have, and the holy apostles did not teach. Now, to Zingley's credit, he's right on a few points. There was a lot of people that viewed something almost supernatural as happening during the point of baptism, where during baptism, you're endued with all this sort of power and mysticism and all this different type of stuff. He's right on that. But he is absolutely 100% wrong when he says that everybody just had it wrong. That all of our preconceived notions about baptism being the point in which salvation happens. Everyone's just wrong about that. And most importantly, he kind of contradicts not just the apostles, not just Jesus, but he contradicts one of the greatest theologians of the first thousand years, Augustine of Hippo, who said apostolic tradition by which the churches of Christ maintain it. And he's not talking about us. He's talking about the body of Christ by which the churches of Christ maintain it to be an inherent principle that without baptism, it is impossible for any man to attain the salvation and everlasting life. Augustine affirmed what we know, what the scriptures teach, what the Bible teaches, what the apostles teach, which is that baptism, once again, doth now save us. That's what we need to realize about baptism, is it's not a sacrament. It's not something we just kind of go through. It's something more than that. And as I have to anticipate this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 says, Baptism is not just the washing of water from the body, but it is an appeal to God for a good conscience. We need to see that there's more happening in baptism than just somebody going up into this pool of water, going down and coming back up. That's what we see. But we oftentimes don't think about the angels in heaven rejoicing. We don't think about the spiritual transformation that needs to take place at that point. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want you to point out a few things that happen during that moment of baptism or during the process of conversion. A baptism is a part of that I think you see here. The first one that we need to realize is that you are 100% completely reborn. Now, I don't think that the moment of baptism, God interjects your heart with some kind of spiritual supernova. <laughs> By which you just all of a sudden can't sin anymore. That's not what is happening during that process. But in John the third chapter, for instance, Jesus discusses this idea with Nicodemus, somebody who came to him by night, somebody who was very obviously afraid of what his contemporaries may think. But in John the third chapter, he shows up to Jesus. And I like how he begins all this by saying in verse 2, he says, He says, Rabbi, we know that you come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus totally blows past that point. Jesus doesn't acknowledge this little nugget of faith that Nicodemus throws out at him. And Jesus answers in verse 3 and says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now keep in mind who Jesus is talking to. He's not talking to some random guy off the street that doesn't know Scripture. He's not talking to some random person that just kind of waltzes in and says, well, I'd like to hear what Jesus has to say on the subject. This is a ruler who's educated, who understands the Bible, understands the Old Testament understands God. And in verse 4, he's confused. He says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? No, you can't, Nicodemus. Listen to what he says in verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, to expound on this idea, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but if you're reading this for the first time, verse 5 doesn't clear anything up to me. Because when he says you must be born of water and of Spirit, to 
me, that just kind of makes it more confusing. But fortunately, Jesus expounds on it. Listen to what he says here in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Verse 8, for the wind blows or wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answers in verse 9, how can these things be? I don't understand this. When Jesus analogizes this idea of conversion by the wind, it talks about the wind, the spirit. What he's saying is sometimes we don't always see what goes into the process of conversion. If you've ever talked to somebody and who's, who's an avowed atheist or somebody who is disinterested in God or somebody who's uninterested in coming back to God, they're an apostate Christian that's apart from God, we, we see them at some points, but we don't see everything that goes on in their life. What we don't see sometimes are those 3 a.m. frantic Bible studies. What we don't see are those entreating prayers. We don't see sometimes those people that come into their life that help move them along. And so what he says here in verses 7 and 8 is, just as the wind moves, just as the wind goes, and you don't always know where it goes, where it comes from, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Paul is the perfect example of this. When Paul is not converted on the road to Damascus, but the process starts, culminates with his baptism, begins the new life, that happens in Acts 9, happens in Acts chapter 22, you've got to kind of see those parallel accounts. When he then goes and tries to attach himself to the saints of Jerusalem, they're completely blown away by this. What has changed in the life of this person that has made him now somebody who is not only not against Christ, but is now preaching out actively for Christ? What's changed in this person? And it's this new life, it's this new rebirth, it's this new world that this person has more or less entered into. In John the third chapter, starting in verse 16, you know that he can't be as some of our religious friends would try to ascribe. It can't just be this idea of mental ascent. It can't just be this kind of supernatural supernova and all of a sudden I have an awakening that wasn't there before. That's not what Jesus is addressing. Because from this point forward, starting in verse 16, Jesus addresses a very permanent and a very deliberate change of life. John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I believe every single word that that verse teaches. But that word belief is compounded and explained by the word verses that follow. Verse 17, God didn't send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged, and he who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice this idea of belief strengthening and kind of being explained more and more, developed more. Verse 19, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and then love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Do you notice what Jesus is getting at? If you are born, as he talks about here in John chapter 3 and verse 5, if you are born of water and the Spirit, it necessitates a change of life. He who practices the things of the light, he who does the deeds of God. That's what we mean when we talk about this idea of being 100% completely reborn. That your old life is gone. Your old life where you had these passions, where you had these strongly held presuppositions, where you had these kind of worldview, all that is annihilated. And now you're viewing everything through thoughtful and continuous obedience to God. I love the way that Paul describes it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Flip over there if you want. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As Paul is talking about his own journey for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. Paul speaks very personally, but I think he speaks also very universally in some ways. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11, he's very much talking about himself as at least an object for us. In verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again committing ourselves to you, but are giving you rather an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ, verse 14, controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, and therefore all died. Notice how the fear of the Lord, the love of God, all that is wrapped up and makes up the core of their teaching. And then in verse 15, kind of the, kind of the big grandiose thing that he makes in this section. He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for 
him who died and rose again on their behalf. That's the life of a Christian, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about somebody being completely reborn, we're not talking about them being just kind of changed a little bit. There's a few things you need to tweak. We're talking about a complete 100% life change that results in a life dedicated and pointed towards God, living for Him rather than for themselves. Building off on this in verse 16, he says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to flesh, even though we have known Christ according to flesh. Yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The life of a Christian is not about going out and doing whatever you want and showing up at services on Sunday and Wednesday, reading your Bible a little bit every once once every couple of years, saying a few prayers once every couple of years. That's not the life of a Christian. The life of a Christian is pointed towards God, completely reborn into this new world. But a fork is where you're looking and you're pointing towards Christ with every single thing that you do. And that's what he talks about when he says in John chapter 3, verse 5, you must be born again. I challenge all of us this morning. You must be born again. The point of baptism. Let me tell you this too about baptism. You are buried with them. Look at Romans, the sixth chapter. I love the way that Paul talks about this whole process of death, burial, resurrection. Look at Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans chapter six, starting in verse one. It talks about this idea of being birth or being born, except the exact opposite. It doesn't talk about born, it's talking about death. In Romans chapter six, he talks about this new death or this death leading to this new life. Romans chapter six, starting in verse one, he's answering questions here that come as a result of chapter five. In chapter 4, we talk heavily about the grace of Christ and living through faith. But now the practical applications, he's kind of tightening the screws on a little bit. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? increase? It may never be. Although that's the argument. If God is gracious, if he's loving, if he's kind, and if he has come to die for our sins, then why can't we just sin some more? Have the best of both worlds. Live for Christ, live for ourselves. That way everything's... Verse 3, he says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, verse 4, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Highlight or underline that verse in your brain, or physically highlight or underline in your Bible if you want to. Because that verse is of utmost importance in this section. Unless we're baptized into his death, we will not be raised to walk in his resurrection. That's the argument that Paul makes there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has freed us from sin. Verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, and death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you're with me so far in this lesson, what you've noticed is that these first two points point out something very peculiar about baptism. That in baptism you both die and you're born again at that moment. <laughs> that in death, or that in baptism, your old self is not just washed away, although we'll talk about that here in a second, but your old self is washed away, but your old self is nailed to a cross, crucified, dead, buried, gone. And that you are reborn to walk with 100% devotion, obedience, and repentance towards God. That's the life that we lead. That's what baptism is about. There are some people that have encountered throughout the years, as if I say that, like I'm some old guru that's been here for hundreds of years. There are some people I've encountered, at least in my short time this year, that have come to me and said, I need to be rebaptized," And that's kind of a misnomer. Because when somebody says they need to be rebaptized, what they're essentially saying is, I wasn't baptized right the first time. And what they're saying is, when I was baptized, I didn't know anything that was going on. And that's not to say that you have to have an advanced degree in baptism or an advanced degree in Christianity. They're saying, when I went into the water and I came out, I didn't really, nothing changed. I didn't really know why I was doing it. I was doing it because my friends were doing it. I was doing it because of church membership. But there was nothing spiritual about that. 
And not to say that you have to have a certain chant. There are certain religions that believe you have to say exactly the right words or your baptism is completely invalid. But you get what I'm saying here. They will argue that at the point of baptism, when they were baptized, they didn't know anything about what was happening. They certainly weren't doing it for the right reasons. They didn't understand what baptism was about. And so for that reason, they want to, quote unquote, be rebaptized at this point in time. And all I chalk that up to when I talk to these people is, number one, a healthy dose of honesty. Number two, a healthy dose of humility to look back at your baptism and say, I didn't know anything. I didn't do it for the right reasons. I wasn't there for any purpose. I did it because I was coerced. I did it because I was humiliated. I did it because I was pressured. I did it to fit in. But I had no knowledge of what that life was about or what that moment was about. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, reference it once again. He says it's not just about getting wet. It's about an appeal towards God for a good conscience. That's what Paul means in Romans chapter 6 when he talks about it being a burial and a resurrection towards God. I want you to look also at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And by the way, I don't say any of this to make anybody neurotic about their own baptism. I know I can, I can look out and I can see. Usually I would pick on the end of these glorious land of West Texas right now. So I'll pick on Joe. You can always look around and see people thinking to themselves, was my baptism valid? It's not my point. My point is, is if you look back at your baptism, you had no idea what was happening, and it was just kind of you jumping in a big tub and jumping out. That's not really baptism. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I think that's what Paul is addressing here in this passage. And so when you look at passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for instance, starting in verse 10, he also drills down on this idea of baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. He says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, well, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paul, I'm a Cephas, I'm a Christ. Has Christ, verse 13, been divided? Paul wasn't crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, was that the summation of your baptism? Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Christmas and Gaius, so that none of you would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. That's not to say they were unimportant. He doesn't really know if there were any other. But what he's pointing out in this passage is that baptism isn't allegiance to Paul or Cephas. Baptism at its core is baptism into Christ. Verse 17, for Christ didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ, that death, that burial, and that eventual resurrection, the cross of Christ, would not be made for him. Put forth you something else if you look in Galatians chapter 3, staying on the same point. In Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 23, Galatians deals heavily with this kind of intersection between Jew and Gentile. In Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 23, he talks about the unity that exists between Christians of all stripes when they're baptized into his church. Galatians chapter 3, and by the way, when I say stripes, I mean racial, social divisions, not denominationalism. That's not what I'm getting at. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, verse 23, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, verse 24, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, because all of you, verse 27, who are baptized in Christ, have now clothed yourselves with Christ. And this is that socio-economic, cultural stamp that he's talking about here in verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. What Jesus, or what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 3 is, this is the unity that you find in Christ. And there are some people that will stamp Christian before another qualifier. I'm a Christian activist. I'm a Christian Republican. I'm a Christian Libertarian. I'm a Christian whatever. You are, according to Galatians chapter 3 verse 23, you are a Christian. That should be the defining factor, the defining name of your life. All of us who are baptized in Christ, all of us who are baptized by faith in Christ, are one under Christ. Probably the most important thing is that your sins, very simply, are washed away. The more I read Acts chapter 2, the more I'm impressed by Peter's 
Augusto, the more I'm impressed with his courage, the more I'm impressed with his honesty. But if you can imagine, if you can imagine in your mind's eye what Peter is going through in Acts the second chapter. Several chapters earlier, Peter has just been, or actually a couple months earlier, Peter has just affirmed in the court of the Jews that he doesn't know who Jesus is. He does that, spoiler, to save his own skin. That's the reason he denounces Jesus. And yet here you find him two months later standing in the middle of the porch of Solomon in the temple, which has probably over 10, 15,000 people in the dark. And he's talking to a large segment of them. And as he builds up this argument, we won't take the time to read all of it, but as he builds up this argument starting in verse 29, it reaches a fever pitch that will only end in one declaration. And in verse 29, this is where it begins. He says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you, regarding the patriarch David, people have died and was buried, the tomb is with us to this day. It's Old Testament prophecies, no. not about David. Verse 30, and so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to see one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that occurs in our way next to you. Verse 34, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Things could have been going fine. And then he really dives in in verse 36, his coup de grace of his entire sermon. That's the worst application of that phrase ever. Just focus on what he says. Verse 36 is the high point. Good girl means nothing in this moment. Verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. You can imagine standing there listening to Paul, Issue, or Peter talk about Old Testament and talk about the events of the last two months. And as you're thinking and you're processing and you're formulating in your own mind about what you've just done, the fact that not only were you disobedient, the fact that not only you rebelled against God, but then you took God himself and nailed him to a cross and spit on him and humiliated him and blasphemed him and murdered him unjustly. The question naturally arises at the end of that, what do you do with something like that? How do you come back from murdering God? How do you repent of putting Jesus, the Christ, God himself, on a cross? How do you come back from that? And they ask in verse 37, brethren, what shall we do? They're cut to the heart. Peter said to repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The one thing that we always look over in this passage, the one thing that we always forget in our efforts to sometimes prove text baptism, the one thing we always gloss over in this passage, is the magnitude and the scope of these people's sins. And the fact that Peter says, you can be forgiven for nailing Jesus to a cross. Ladies and gentlemen, these people can be forgiven for murdering Jesus. You can be forgiven of anything and everything you've ever done in your life, if you would but repent and obey him. Several years later, in Acts chapter 22, as Peter, as Paul rather, is recounting his life, and he would later call himself the chief of all sinners. And he would call himself, you know, the, the worst of all. He says here in Acts chapter 22, talking about this conversation he had with Ananias after he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 12, he says, A certain Ananias, a man who was by, devout by the standard of the law, and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. In other words, he is right according to your model. Verse 13, came to me and standing near to me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up to him. And he said to me, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him to all men of whom you have seen and heard. That's his life from that point forward in two verses. You will hear God, you will speak his word amongst all the nations, and you will go to all the men on earth. But you have to do something first. Verse 16. Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. Before you can preach repentance, before you can preach forgiveness, before you can preach baptism, you have to do those things. Yeah. You have to have your sins washed away. The wall of God. I love Psalm 103. Ah. I got nervous when John said Psalm 130. I had to realize I was talking about Psalm 103, not 130. I thought he was going to read my big closing. 
Then Psalm 103. No. Starting in verse 8, or verse 6. Right? Psalm 103, starting in verse 6. David writes, the Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are blessed. He made known his ways to Moses and acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger. He's a bounty Lord and kindness. He will not always write with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our friend, and he knows, or he is mindful, that we are but lost. David writes in that psalm, Psalm 103, one massive thing, which is the fact, quite frankly, we don't get what we deserve. We deserve death. We deserve to be ostracized from God by virtue of what we've done. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve for Jesus to come down here and give his life on the cross so that we can be saved. But God knows, even knowing that we're but dust, he's compassionate and he's loving and forgiving. Don't look at the cross of Christ. And don't look at the sacrifice of Jesus with condescension or with repetition in your hearts. And don't look down on it. Maybe it's, that's it's the gift of God that's meant to save you from the destruction of your souls. Ladies and gentlemen, that new life begins with baptism. That new life is through the baptism. You're very blessed. You are born. You 